one of the most interesting parts of, of your story that really all of us can relate to is how you fell into a hate group. And, and it's not what people would think. It's, it's actually something that, that everyone can relate to. Yeah, you know, I think most people think that, you know, anybody who is part of a hate group or, you know, has hateful ideologies came from a broken home with, you know, abuse. And, and you know, there is one thing that is consistent is there is always trauma. Um, but I, I actually came from a pretty loving home. Um, and I felt really marginalized growing up. I was bullied. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was kept inside of a bubble uh, where I never got the opportunity to develop close relationships with people. So I became very angry and felt very abandoned by my parents, even though they were trying to do the right thing. They were just working hard. Um, they were Italian immigrants. Yeah, they were Italian immigrants who came over in the 60s, and there wasn't racism at home. They were the victims of prejudice when they came. Uh, but they had to work extra hard because they were immigrants, and I just didn't see them. They were gone seven days a week, 14 hours a day. So I found acceptance um, at 14 years old in 1987, standing in an alley. And a man came up to me who was one of America's first neo-Nazi skinheads. He was the first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. Uh, and he played on my fears and my vulnerability. And he promised me an identity, a community, and a purpose. And I grabbed it because I wasn't able to find that up until then. And that, that's what was missing. That's what was missing. It was my connection to other people. I felt really disenchanted and, and marginalized and, and uh, you know, had a baseball coach walked up to me in that alley at 14, I probably would have been a hell of a baseball player. But instead it was, you know, somebody with an agenda who recognized that he could manipulate me and I eventually bought in. Now that man was Clark Martell, right? Uh, what did he tell you? How did he get you in to this group? It's really no different than how people are recruiting today. Um, he was playing on my vulnerabilities, but he drew me in through a sense of pride. Uh, he asked me what my name was, and he recognized it was Italian, and he would tell me that my ancestors did amazing things and that they were great uh, composers and warriors and philosophers. And, you know, I kind of knew that because I'd grown up in this Italian family. That was really all I knew. So I didn't think that there was anything wrong with that. I was proud of those things. Uh, until he started to tell me that there were people who wanted to take that pride away, that wanted to destroy my culture, uh, that wanted to take away my whiteness or my European heritage. And uh, then he would start to name who those people were, and it was always about blaming the other. It was about the Jews who controlled uh, the entertainment industry and news and finance or th other conspiracy theories about uh, African Americans committing, you know, crimes against whites or immigrants stealing jobs. My parents were immigrants, and they started their own business, so I didn't see this happening. Uh, but it made me afraid enough to, to really take action. Did you ever question what he was telling you? Every day, every day for the eight years that I was involved, from the time I was 14 until I was 22, there was always something that I questioned about it. But it wasn't a strong enough pull, and I wasn't brave enough to. Um, to leave because of those questions, because the identity, the community, and the purpose that I was finding in this movement was so strong, and it was what I, what I needed at the time. Well, do you remember the first words that he told you? Because, I mean, <laughs> often people don't go in saying, well, we're going to commit violent acts against people if you win, right? I mean, it right. starts slowly. That's exactly how it started. It, it was kind of, you know, the sense of pride was the gateway drug. Uh, you know, and in reality, my, my culture is not being destroyed. My European heritage is not under attack. Um, but e even today, they're making people think that it is through slogans like, it's okay to be white or white lives matter. Um, and the first words that he said to me at 14 years old when I was standing in that alley, I was smoking a joint, he came and he pulled that joint from my lips and he said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. I can tell you, Monica, at 14 years old, I had no idea what a communist, what a Jew was, or even what the word docile meant. Uh, and it wasn't about ideology or politics. I had no idea about that. But what drew me in was his lifeline uh, of belonging to this group. And I did find camaraderie there until I recognized that it was about destruction and self-destruction. Uh, talk to me about your time in the group, um, how you started to change what your life was like? 
you know, my life during those eight years that I was involved uh, in the white power skinhead movement was a series of violence, a series of me learning how to target other vulnerable young people to promise them lies about paradise. Um, but I started to also meet people that shouldn't have liked me because of the things that I said and I did. And I began to receive compassion from the people that I least deserved it from at a time when I, frankly, I least deserved it. Uh, and it was those conversations that allowed me to stop the demonization that was happening in my head and have it replaced by humanization. And suddenly I connected with uh, people who were African American and Jewish and gay and I realized that I actually had a lot more in common with them than the people I'd surrounded myself with. Had you ever met any of the people that you no, hated? Never. Very, I had no meaningful interactions with the people I thought I hated. And in fact, that, that's the case with all the people that I work with, is they've, they're so isolated and they're so afraid that they've never given themselves the opportunity to have those meaningful interactions. Uh, so it's easy to hate and dehumanize somebody that you don't know or don't see as human. Uh, but it isn't until you actually get to interact with them and understand uh, that while there might be things that make us different, those are the things that make us beautiful, the culture, the language, the food, uh, and not things to divide us. I think it's, it's fascinating that you fell so far into this group. You were the head of it at one time, and now it's completely changed. Uh, yeah. What happened? What was it that completely changed your mind? Well, you know, it was a series of a lot of really important events that happened in my life. Uh, you know, certainly meeting people that I had, I thought I had differing opinions from, uh, helped. Um, the birth of my children kind of challenged my sense of identity, community, and purpose. Was I a hate monger or was I a father? Was my community the one I'd surrounded myself with uh, to make me feel better about myself? Or was it the one I'd given life to? And suddenly I just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile my actions, my beliefs. They weren't based on any foundation of truth. And I started to discover the truth based on what I became exposed to, and that was people. Uh, and the hate, which was really self-loathing. It was me hating other people because I was projecting my own pain. I didn't want to feel that pain, so I hurt other people to make them feel worse than I did so that I could feel better about myself. I recruited other young kids uh, as a way to you know, really make up for the fact that I was miserable about my life. I wanted to make other people miserable. What would you tell young kids? How would you, how would you target them? Would you, would you find specific kids that you said, oh, that's the guy we're gonna, we're gonna get in? Yeah, well, first I would say that you know, all the things that we might be hearing about you know, white males being under attack and white European culture being under attack are completely false. Uh, you know, White males may feel like they're being targeted right now because of things like the Me Too movement and feminist movements rising, but what's happening is equalization. Nobody's getting anything taken away from them. There are groups who've been marginalized for too long who are now finally starting to get some justice. Uh, and we still have a long way to go. But for young people, I would say question everything because most of what you read online is fake. It's the same propaganda that I used to put out in mailboxes and on windshields, and now the power of the internet has made it so that it's very difficult not to step into this extreme right conspiracy theory and propaganda. Um, and I think that that's what they really need to be focused on, as well as the fact that they're being targeted in safe zones while they're playing video games through their headsets. There are people indoctrinating them uh, in autism forums online. These groups are now starting to target our most vulnerable communities because they know that there are marginalized people who feel powerless in those communities and they're offering them a narrative, a fake narrative, uh, to, to draw them into these hateful ideologies. How do you know all this? Are you still connected with any of those groups? Or how, how, do, you, how do you know the tactics that they're using today? Well, you know, I've, I've, I've dedicated the last 20 years of my life to trying to dismantle what it was that I helped build. Um, and I get phone calls and emails from uh, devastated parents every day uh, who are worried about their son or their daughter potentially being the next uh, you know, mass killer uh, or committing a tragedy. Um, and it forces me to really be engaged and to understand what's happening now. It's really not that different from what I was involved in 30 years ago, and it's changed. Uh, you know, it looks different, and the words maybe are a little bit more palatable, and they're dog whistles, uh, but
but the, the mission is the same. It really is about blaming the other for the problems that exist, when in fact, in most cases, they're problems that exist because we've created them ourselves. Um, so, I, you know, unfortunately, I have to stay in the world and observe uh, and talk to people who are engaged in this on a daily basis and sit across from some people who say really ugly things and do really monstrous things. And I don't look at them as monsters. I look at them as, as that kid who I was at 14 years old standing in that alley uh, who was misled and who can be guided back. How do you guide people back? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, it's a lot of listening involved with, with trying to help people find their way back, but what I do is I fill those potholes that they've experienced that led them there. Uh, and, and those are things like job training or mental health therapy or life coaching or tattoo removal. Uh, but it's about finding them a new community, a new identity and a new purpose, one that's positive. Uh, <clears throat> because when they feel more resilient, when they're more whole, there's less of a need to blame the other for what's happening. Uh, and they can now be accountable of themselves. Do you find that um there's more of a resurgence of this now. I mean, we had Charlottesville, <coughs> we have these Me Too movements, right. uh, but we, it, it seems like people are coming out of the woodwork who might have just been hiding in the shadows before. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because it's much more difficult to track these days because the look is different. It was easy to identify me 30 years ago because I was a skinhead. I, I wore what I was on my clothing. And now the clothing has become an attempt to blend in, to normalize. Uh, but I do think there is a resurgence. I do think that this has become an epidemic uh, in young uh, white circles. I think it's, it's become an attraction for people who feel marginalized in real life, uh, who now find acceptance with other people who might be going through that same kind of misery. Uh, it's become attractive because young people are idealistic. And frankly, right now, we're seeing young people be very successful at changing the way that we look at the world. Uh, and for those who maybe don't have those same resources or those positive influences, they're trying to, in their eyes, change the world, uh, but they're doing so in, in really negative ways. When you talk to youth who have maybe fallen off the path and gone to a really dark place like you did, um, do, you, do you get a lot of resistance from them? I mean, do they even want to see you when you come? Well, to most of them, I'm what they would consider a race traitor. Uh, I've abandoned their movement and, and uh, you know, they see me as an enemy in many cases. Um, but I think I've, because I was a part of what they were a part of, I've developed a thicker skin to sit and listen. So what might trigger the average person doesn't trigger me because I've heard it, I've said it. Um, it doesn't have that effect. So I can remain calm and I can build a trust and build a rapport with people and I do really genuinely care about them. I, I do want to sit and listen to them and I think if there's any hesitation that that usually goes away. Um, but I also am not an aggressive person with them. I'm not there to attack them for what they believe in. Uh, I'm there to offer a fresh perspective. Um, I mean, you've so taken people in to get swastikas removed from I their have. face. Yeah. I have. How do you get to that point? I mean, someone was passionate enough to put it on their forehead and you get them to a point where they're passionate enough to take it off. You know, connecting with humanity is a pretty powerful thing. Uh, and uh, sometimes realizing that what you've done to, to hurt the world is a very shameful and should be a very shameful experience. Uh, and I think shame uh, and amends are part of these people holding themselves accountable for that. I always encourage people to tell their story because more people need to hear it. Um, but I can also tell you that ideology and dogma are not what brought them in and that they adopted it because that was their license to be angry. That was their reason and, and, and uh, you know, unfortunately people get drawn into pretty dark situations that are very hard to get out of. Uh, and you know, my job is to maybe just try and make that a little bit easier. Uh, you talk about shame. Do you still feel any shame? Of course I do. I do. I mean, I, I know I planted a lot of seeds of hate many years ago, and I'm still pulling the weeds out from them today. Um, you know, I am ashamed for the things that I did. I hurt a lot of people, uh, not to mention the young people whose lives I changed by drawing them in, uh, who might have gone on to, you know, live really happy, normal lives, and because of me, they didn't. Uh, and I know that exponentially, that goes out into the world, and that affects a lot more people than I 
personally touched. Uh, that's also another reason why I've really dedicated my life to this, because I know that I'm partly responsible. Uh, this is part of my amends, uh, is to really be an ally and to be a voice against this. Music was a big part of your propaganda. Yeah. Uh, you are the front man for a white supremacist band, and that music still Two gets passed them. around. <laughs> Two of them, okay. Yeah. yeah, it still gets passed around today. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, I do still find my music online, um, places like YouTube or uh, CD Baby, uh, and I've attempted to have them removed, and sometimes I've been successful, and sometimes I've been told uh, that uh, I don't have the authority to do that, I don't have the copyright to, to do that, even though I was the one who owns the copyright and, and wrote the music. Uh, and, you know, those seeds that I talked about planting many years ago and that are still sprouting, it occurred to me about four months ago when somebody had showed me a posting that Dylan Roof had made uh, on a white supremacist website. And in that post he was looking, uh, he had seen a documentary and there was a band in this documentary and he was asking about the lyrics because he wanted to find the name of the band. And after I read it, um, you know, I said, yeah, music is powerful, you know, like it brings people to think certain things. And then my friend asked me to read it again. And I read it again, and that, it was at that point that I recognized that those were my lyrics that I wrote 30 years ago that he had posted about four months uh, before he walked into the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and murdered nine innocent people because of the color of their skin. So, you know, we have to be careful with our words because they have consequences, uh, even after we've said them and disengaged from them. Uh, so it's so important that people understand that the things that they're searching for when they're trying to find meaning often lead them into very dark places. Um, and before they know it, it could destroy their lives and the lives of other people around them. I can hear the emotion in your voice when you talk about that. Where does your head go when you think about Dylan Roof uh, listening to music? You know, I always think that <laughs> You know, I always want to be that person that I wish would have come up to me in the alley that day. Um, and I, you know, I wish I could have been that for somebody like Dylan Roof before he went down that path. Uh, and to some degree, you know, I still feel a lot of shame, but I'm also angry because I know that there are uh, programs that are not being funded that are combating this, that are trying to bring this to light. There are organizations who are, are not being talked about who are doing amazing work in this space to try and educate people on what's happening. And the fact that it is not really a priority for our government to focus on white extremism, even though since 9-11 more Americans have been killed by white supremacists than by any other foreign or domestic terrorist group combined, we are still not calling it terrorism. So to some degree it's frustrating and makes me angry that as a nation, we still can't admit the problems that we have already in our own borders. Yeah, the president is going to be in town tomorrow, the vice president, the NRA is starting a convention today. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would tell them? I'm open for business if anybody would like to talk. I would love to sit down uh, with Mr. Trump um, to understand why he says the things he does or why he makes the decisions he makes. And I would listen because I'm sure that there are a lot of potholes there that need to be filled. Uh, something that, that you do that I think is really interesting is that you introduce people who, who mm -hmm. are part of hate groups to the people that they hate. Yeah. Talk about that. So as part of the pothole filling process that I do where I, you know, I try and make people more resilient, the way I do challenge their ideology is by introducing them to the people that they think that they hate. Uh, because nine and a half times out of ten, they've never had those interactions before. And, uh, you know, it changes people to, to replace the prejudice that they've had in their head. Uh, you know, this demon that, that is, you know, that they've made other people subhuman. Uh, to finally meet those people and realize that they're nothing like what they've been thinking about uh, is, is a pretty fascinating uh, and very compelling experience to see. Um, because it's, it's somebody coming to life. It's somebody reaching down and finding something that they maybe never knew existed. And the compassion, frankly, that these brave people have on the other side who are willing to do this 
and it's not their responsibility to do that um, is remarkable. It's really, it's, it is really an amazing thing to witness. It ends up uh, changing lives. Absolutely. I mean, they become friends in some cases. They do. In many cases, they do. I've had so many people uh, who've gone on after I've introduced them in a couple of very safe sessions to, you know, to go on and be good friends. There's an individual in, in Buffalo uh, who was extremely Islamophobic who I introduced to an imam, and it's rare now that you don't see them eating falafel together at, you know, at the local uh, Mediterranean place, or, or a young girl from Florida who was a Holocaust denier and was making propaganda videos who I introduced to a 96-year-old female Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz, and, and now they're amazing friends. Uh, Elsie, who's 96, is, is so young at heart, and she's an amazing mentor to this young girl. And, you know, it's those kinds of situations that really change the world. And I do think that we all have the ability to do that. What advice would you give people who see this and, and you know, they, they want to go out and change the world. They want to have compassion. They want to be able to talk to somebody who's hateful and change their mind. But they don't know how to go about doing that. I mean, that's a hard bridge to cross. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you, how do you change someone's mind without getting combative? Well, I would challenge people, I think, to go and find somebody that they think is undeserving of their compassion and give it to them because I guarantee you they're the ones who really need it the most. In what way do you think? Just walk up and talk to someone? You know, I think we have situations in our daily lives as we're walking past people on the street, you know, that looking in somebody's eyes is much better than looking at your pixels or you know, taking your young son or daughter to eat ethnic food so that maybe they grow up not afraid of ethnic food and they won't be afraid of ethnic people. Uh, you know, there are ways that everybody has the tools to, to change the people closest to them. You know, teachers can teach their students about tolerance and, and inclusion and, and justice. Uh, and we can confront the mistakes we've made in the past because I think we have still not confronted our own genocides as a country against the natives, against African-American slaves, and, and there are a lot of things that we can be doing as part of the national conversation with friends, family, coworkers, uh, that everybody has the ability to do. You talked about compassion uh, that was given to you that yeah. changed your life, slowly. Yeah. Was there anything that stuck out? You know, they all stick out. <laughs> Uh, because they were all such eye-opening experiences for me. Um, you know, there was a, a young, uh, young black teenager who came into my record store one day, uh, and my point was to sell white power music in this store. And, uh, you know, after coming in several times and me really being cold to him and not wanting to have a conversation, one time I recognized he was in pain and I asked, and uh, he told me that his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And suddenly I could relate to that because my own mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer and, and here was this young kid who I thought I had nothing in common with and suddenly we were both able to be vulnerable with each other and realize that that was actually our greatest strength. And uh, I've actually taken that and incorporated it into my life and, and how I just move forward. That vulnerability sometimes can be our greatest strength, that kindness is not weakness. I remember you talking a few months ago about how you were committing an act of violence against someone and in an instant you saw their humanity. Yeah, that was uh, one of those catalysts that, that happened that really woke me up and, and I would, you know, looking back, I think it was 91 or 92, I may have been, you know, 17 or 18 years old. And it was one night, very late after, you know, being out with friends drinking and, and we'd gone into a restaurant where there were some black teenagers in line and uh, I remember uh, very distinctly screaming at them, saying it was mine and that they needed to leave. And of course we were you know, very intimidating, so they left, they ran out, and we chased them. And as we chased them across the street, um, one of the black teenagers pulled out a pistol and started to fire at us, and uh, the gun jammed. Uh, but when we caught this individual, this teenager, um, we beat him very, very badly. And I remember, uh, and this had never happened before, and I still don't know why, but I remember as I was kicking him, as he was on the ground, that his eyes, his swollen eyes, and his face that was covered in blood kind of opened and my eyes connected with his. And I felt instant empathy for this person that I was trying to kill. 
Um, and I thought for a minute that it could be my brother or you know, somebody that I cared about. And I recognized the impact it would have on this person and the people that loved him. Uh, and that was the last time that I committed an act of violence. And, and it was a very powerful moment for me. Um, and uh, I'll never forget that. I remember you talking about dog whistles too, about words that we hear commonly that might have been planted as seeds in the past. Can you talk about that? You know, 30 years ago when I was a skinhead, uh, we even recognized then that our tactics and our marketing wasn't very good, that we were alienating the people that we wanted to recruit because we were too edgy. We were using language that was, uh, you know, even to the average American white racist was maybe even too offensive. So we started to change our tactics and we started to try and blend in by changing our appearance and going from boots to suits and, and going to college campuses to recruit and even getting jobs in law enforcement and going to the military. Um, and we started to use a more palatable message. We started to uh, stop blaming a global Jewish conspiracy and started to call it globalism. And the idea that multiculturalism was uh, the death of white culture that it was a conspiracy by you know, Jewish people and African Americans to destroy white culture. But they don't say that anymore. Now they just use rhetoric, fear rhetoric about immigrants coming in and stealing jobs, which we also used. They'll use dog whistles like the liberal media when it's very clear to me that they're talking about the global Jewish conspiracy and how they control the media, especially when they're showing pictures of George Soros and other prominent Jewish figure, uh, figures who are demonized regularly by the far right. Uh, so I know that they're speaking to a very specific crowd, but I also know that there are well-meaning people who are now using these words that don't know exactly uh, what the intention of those words are. Uh, so I, you know, I really hope to make them aware that you know, a lot of the language that the far right uses has been intentionally injected in there. Um, you know, neocon is another one when they're talking about elite Jews. Alex Jones uses these words all the time. Uh, so I would just advise people to be very careful about the ideas and the concepts that they buy into and the choices of words that they make. You're starting to see that come to fruition? Yeah, I am. Uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, I think people are skeptical about it uh, because they've been using these as regular words and they haven't meant to use them in negative ways. Um, but I think as they see more people from the extreme right using them, that it's kind of an aha moment that they may have been unintentionally complicit in something. Uh, one thing that's interesting to me is you were once a Holocaust denier, right? Yeah. Uh, you once lived in a room with swastikas. You had swastikas on your body. Now you're invited by the Holocaust Museum to speak. There's going to be Holocaust survivors in that audience. You speak to a lot of people, but is tonight different? You know, I'm speaking to human beings, so I think I'm, I'm really just trying to help people understand what's happening in the world today and how people can be led to believe those things and, and then in turn, you know, take on violent actions to hurt people. Um, you know, every time I tell my story, it's a very personal moment for me. Uh, and it's very special um, because I have to find it in myself to bear my soul uh, and, and really expose myself. But I know that I do that uh, and it makes me stronger because it helps me understand me. And if I can help other people understand what people like me did 30 years ago, um, then I know I'm doing just a small part uh, in trying to make the world a better place. Um, I still hold myself accountable. Um, and I'm so honored to be able to partner with organizations and, uh, like the Dallas Holocaust Museum who really have the same mission, and that is to educate people on what is happening in the world, not just about what happened during their Holocaust, but what happened in genocides you know, in our country and in our society uh, that we never talk about. Um, and it really is about standing up for the most vulnerable uh, and, and making people aware that the threat still exists today. You talk about the threat still existing. What's your greatest fear with that? My greatest fear is that we are becoming so divided that we won't find a place to find common ground anymore. The voices on the extremes are so loud right now. We're all 
being made to feel that we need to choose a side. The reality is, is most of us float in the middle, depending on the issue, depending on you know, what's important to us. Um, I would suggest that we need to start in the middle with the things we have in common, even with the most, you know, the ugliest people that we can see because we're American, we want security for our children, we want an education, we want health, we want those things, everybody. And if we start in the middle, eventually we'll go off track and that's okay, but we'll always have a place in the middle to come back to. If we start out on the extremes with the intention of getting to the middle, we never get there. And that, I think, is what I'm the most afraid of, besides losing truth. Truth is the biggest thing under attack. Your job is so important today. Probably the most important job out there. Because once we lose truth, I don't know that we can find it again. Because what do we have to compare it to? Yeah, you're right. And, and there, there is so much, uh, so many lies now floating around, like you said, on the internet. And uh, yeah. I think for some people, it's hard to decipher what is true. And it is, you know, there's, there's so much information and so much noise, it's hard to distinguish what's real, what's parody, what's propaganda, what's fake news, what's misinformation, and, and frankly, there's a lot of it out there. Uh, there's always been a lot of it out there, but it's just much easier to step into these days, and, and because of the way technology is and algorithms and the way that they, the internet loves to curate everything for us, that, you know, if you make the misstep of stepping into one of these sites and, and reading this news, well, your feeds start to become propagated with them because it thinks that that's what you want to see. Uh, so I really would love to work with technology companies to understand how young people are becoming radicalized online because it's almost exclusively happening there. Uh, and the tactics that they're using are becoming very, very destructive and disturbing. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that they're starting to understand there's a problem finally, uh, but it remains to be seen what the solution is for those problems. Sure. You keep coming back to Dallas. I know you said you've been here four times in the last uh, I think few in the months, last few right? months, six months, I've been here four times. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty incredible. What is it about Dallas? You know, I think Dallas is a, just an incredible city that's growing with a lot of history. Um, you know, and most people don't know this, but the organization that I was one of the leaders of, the Hammerskin Nation, actually started here in the Dallas area, in Denton. Uh, so there, there was even a long-standing connection for me here. Um, but I've always been welcomed here uh, by the people, uh, and uh, it seems like a city of progress, so I'm, I'm happy to just add my voice to it. If there's one thing that people leave with tonight, what do you hope it is? Hope. There are good people out there doing good things, and those are things that can be replicated by the average person, and it's about listening, it's about compassion, and it's about empathy, and we need to find a way to, to humanize America again, because I don't know that we know what America is anymore. And I hope we can find it again. I hope so too. Uh, anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, I recently launched a new uh, nonprofit called the Free Radicals Project, um, freeradicals.org, and it's a, essentially a global platform for people who want to disengage from hate. Um, we're there, we're all formers, we understand where they came from. We're not going to judge them, but we want to help them disengage. Uh, and uh, we're one of the only people doing this in the world. Um, and if people need help, they, they can contact us without worrying about judgment. Um, if they seriously want help leaving, uh, or if a bystander or a family member knows somebody, uh, we think we can help. Awesome. Thank you so much. I Thank really you. appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, and, and we don't necessarily need this on camera, but, but I'm just curious, uh, when you leave a hate group, just like any gang, I mean, is there violence against you, or is, is there fear of, you know, death threats, things? Like, when you left, <laughs> what, what what happened? What was it like? Well, I mean, 23 years later, I still get death threats every day. I still get, uh, you know, social media threats. I still get my address published. I still, uh, you know, have people attacking uh, my kids and my wife online. Uh, it's you know, it's dangerous, but it's not more dangerous than staying in. So, you know, it's worth every, you know, there are people going through much, much worse than I am in this world. Uh, so I feel really lucky to be able to have the privilege to be able to tell my story because I know a lot of people wouldn't get that second chance. Yeah, you're right. And a lot of people, uh, you know, who may be disengaged are ashamed and, and they don't speak out publicly like you do. I get emails all the time from people that say, I just saw an interview with you and 
I have the same story and I haven't told anybody in 15 years, I've never dealt with that, that trauma of me being a part of that. Um, my wife doesn't know, my you know, employers, my friends don't know, and we provide a, you know, an online private community for them to, to give each other community therapy. And it's some of the most amazing human beings that I've ever met. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And probably telling your story is healing, I would think. You know, it, it is cathartic. I mean, it's definitely, uh, I learn about myself every time I tell it. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's like a, a welcome pain, you know, like it's, it's, I know there are so many, so few people who have the experience that I have that are willing to tell it, um, that it's become so important for me to do it. Um, you know, it's my life. I'm, I am ashamed of who I was, but I'm not ashamed of who I am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I do believe that, that people can see this message and, and feel better about themselves to be able to come out and tell it too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it inspires just everyday people to be more compassionate and to see people through a different lens of maybe somebody who's in pain or who doesn't like themselves and they're projecting that onto other people. Absolutely. I mean, what I'm doing is not rocket science. I'm just being a human being. And, and you know, I learned the hard way how to do that because I was not a human being for, you know, eight years of my life. Uh, we all have the ability to give this compassion. We all have the ability to spot that outsider kid, the lonely, uh, angry, you know, marginalized young person who feels like they don't belong. And it's our responsibility to try and, and empower those people instead of turning our back from them. Um, because it really is you know, a, a big shame that we're failing young people, I think, today by you know, allowing those types of you know, silos and circles to happen when we really have the power to amplify their passions, and we don't. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And it, it might not be as hard as people think. I mean, something as simple as just taking the time to go say hi and you know, see, what, see what their interests are. That quiet, shy kid who doesn't belong is screaming for your attention. The ones that are the quietest are the ones who are screaming the loudest. So I think we do need to pay attention. And you probably know that better than anyone. Unfortunately, I think I do. Yeah, yeah.